we are here today to hear from women and doctors about how Georgia's abortion ban is impacting the health of Georgia women. After the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, a Georgia law took effect banning abortion after just six weeks of pregnancy, at which point many women do not even know they're pregnant. The Subcommittee on Human Rights has convened this hearing roughly two years since the reversal of Roe v. Wade to hear from women and doctors in Georgia about the impact on women's health of Georgia's six-week abortion ban. Eight weeks ago, the subcommittee heard from Georgia OBGYNs who testified that our state's abortion ban puts the lives of Georgia women at unnecessary risk and drives OBGYNs out of Georgia, where already more than 50% of counties have no OBGYN at all. Today, in addition to receiving continued testimony from healthcare providers, we will hear directly from women who, despite having high risk or non viable pregnancies, were forced either to remain pregnant or to leave the state for necessary care. I want to thank our witnesses for testifying today, particularly those of you who are here to speak about your personal experiences seeking health care under Georgia's six week abortion ban for your bravery in sharing your experiences with the public. I know this is a complex issue that evokes strong feelings, and that's why it's absolutely critical that the public hear from people who are directly impacted by the law and from physicians. We often hear politicians weighing in on this issue, but today we're going to hear from patients who have been denied necessary medical care in our state while carrying high-risk, complex pregnancies, and we'll continue to hear from healthcare professionals who treat women and support them throughout pregnancy every day. Now I will swear in our witnesses. I'll begin with introductions. Ms. Mackenzie Kulik is a public health researcher from Atlanta, Georgia, who experienced serious complications with her pregnancy in the second trimester. She was unable to get an abortion in Georgia and had to travel out of state to receive health care. Ms. Yasmin Ziad is a resident of Morrow, Georgia. She found out her pregnancy was not viable in her first trimester, but was unable to terminate the pregnancy. Dr. Carrie Swiak is an OBGYN who has been providing reproductive health care in Atlanta, Georgia for 23 years. She is a member of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Society of Family Planning and holds a master's degree in epidemiology. She also conducts research on the impact of Georgia's abortion ban. Before opening statements, we'll swear in the witnesses. If you would all please rise and raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may take your seats. And when you're prepared to begin, we'll hear the opening statement first from Ms. Kulik. Good morning, Senator Ossoff. My name is Mackenzie Kulik, and I'm here to tell you about one of the worst and deeply personal medical experiences of my life. It will be difficult for me to share these things with you today, and I appreciate your patience. I was born in Round Rock, Texas, and graduated from Ohio Northern University and Emory University with degrees in biology and public health, but Georgia is my home. I moved to Atlanta 16 years ago for graduate school. I met my husband 13 years later, and we married shortly thereafter. We've always wanted to start a family, and last November, we were excited to find out that we were expecting our first child. It was a very special time for us, a feeling that I am sure many people can relate to. We were preparing to become parents. Everything went the way it was supposed to go for the next few months. We attended our various medical appointments. We prepared our baby's room and read books on parenting. We learned that we were having a baby girl and started a list of names we both liked. But our world began to change after our 15-week appointment. We found out that our baby had a 1 in 32 chance of having a spinal tube disorder. 
And then at 17 weeks, I started bleeding. I was admitted to the hospital for overnight observation, and my doctors ordered an ultrasound, and the te technician could not detect our baby's face or body. I was lying in the hospital bed when I saw my doctor walk in to discuss the results of the ultrasound, and I just knew something was wrong. I was terrified. The doctor told me that I had oligohydramnios, borderline anhydramnios, which meant that I did not have enough amniotic fluid for the baby. And usually this is a symptom of a serious medical condition. My doctor and I spoke for at least 30 minutes. And I'm a research scientist by trade and wanted to make sure that I understood everything so that we could figure out how to help our baby. My doctor's advice was that I should stay on limited bed rest and drink water and drink as much water as possible. When the doctor left, I tried to process what was happening. And I did what I always do for medical questions. And then searched the medical literature to see what the science said. And when I did, my heart dropped. The medical literature was unequivocal. When this happens so early in pregnancy, the pregnancy should be terminated. And if the low amniotic fluid was caused by my water breaking prematurely, then I was also at risk of developing a life-threatening infection. I did not understand why my doctor did not share any of this information with me. It made me think that maybe my case wasn't that bad, or that I had made a mistake when reading the medical literature and that maybe our baby still had a chance. For the next three weeks, I did exactly what my doctor told me to do. I stayed in bed, I drank a lot of water, and I was afraid. At the 18-week ultrasound, nothing had changed. My doctor gave me the same advice, limited bed rest and fluids. At our 20-week ultrasound, the images of our baby looked significantly worse. And my doctor was oddly quiet when they told me my amniotic fluid was basically non-existent. And they said that our baby's skull had started to elongate. And that she was not growing the way that she should have been. And it became clear to me at this time, as much as I was in denial, that her baby was not going to make it. Fighting back the tears, I asked my doctor the question I had been holding in for the last three weeks did we need to consider terminating the pregnancy? At this point, it was just the three of us in the room, my doctor, me, and my husband. My doctor turned to me and said that the next conversation we were about to have was completely off the record, that it would not be in my visit notes, and I was not allowed to send any follow-up questions. Then my doctor turned to me and told me that our baby was not going to make it. And that if we did not terminate soon, the baby would either die in utero, she would die shortly after being born, or I was likely to develop an infection due to what they now assumed was my water breaking in the late first trimester. And it was heartbreaking to hear this. Accepting that we are never going to meet or hold our baby girl, it was the thing that I feared the most. And it was also a prognosis that I should have been told weeks earlier. Instead of giving me the science, my doctors told me to drink water. And I thought back to those weeks I spent on bed rest, racked with anxiety, hoping and praying. I was shocked that despite the fact that my baby was not going to make it, and continuing the pregnancy posed a risk to my health, my case apparently did not qualify for an exemption under Georgia's abortion law. The only way I could get the medically necessary care was to travel to a different state. The doctor wished me good luck, and we parted ways. And yet it still got worse. I spent the next two days on the phone with my insurance company and doctor's offices, trying to get appointments with an out-of-state physician in my network. I had to repeat the story of our baby girl and how she was not going to live and how we are choosing to terminate the pregnancy because we loved her so much and we did not want her to suffer. And I had to tell this story over and over and over again. No one seemed to know how to handle the situation. Once the appointments were set, it still felt like it was going to be a luck of the draw 
as to whether or not my insurance companies would approve the claims that would eventually come in. And some of my insurance claims were initially denied because I did not have and could not get a written referral for an abortion from a Georgia doctor. While the outcome of our pregnancy would have been the same, no matter what path we took or what laws were in place, we were never going to be able to take home the baby that we wanted so badly. It was jarring, shocking, and disheartening that my Georgia doctors could not provide me with the standard of care. The science did not matter. I did not matter. And my baby's fatal medical condition did not matter. If I had not been able to travel out of state, I would have been forced to carry a non-viable pregnancy until the baby died in utero. Or I would have developed an infection that threatened my health enough to qualify for an intervention. Or I would have had to deliver a baby only to watch her suffer. Her underdeveloped lungs would never have had a chance to take a breath of air on their own. My physicians in Georgia did everything they could for me with their hands tied behind their backs by Georgia's abortion laws. And I do not blame my Georgia doctors. I cannot imagine the anguish of knowing without question what your patient needs, but instead being forced to tell them to drink, to rest and drink water. My Georgia doctors could care for their patients or they could follow the law, but they could not do both. And Senator Ossoff, my story is not unique. Georgia's laws have and will continue to do this uh, to more pregnant women, more preg George pregnant Georgian women and their families. And it is wrong. Women in Georgia should not have to leave the state to get the best advice on how to care for themselves or their babies. My husband and I are still trying to start a family. And the sad thought has crossed my mind that we might be safer doing so in a place other than Georgia, our community and our home. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kulik, for your courage in sharing that statement with the subcommittee and the Senate. Ms. Ziad, when you're ready, we'll hear your opening statement, please. Good morning, Senator. Um, members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing me to come and share my story. I am Yasmin Ziad, a 44-year-old native of Atlanta, Georgia, who currently resides in Morrow, Georgia. In 2016, I met the man of my dreams, and in 2020, we were excited to find out that we were expecting our first child together. Unfortunately, at 11 weeks, we experienced a miscarriage. The fetus stopped growing at nine weeks, four days. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, medical interventions were limited. The doctors administered vaginal pills and oral pills um, to manage the miscarriage at home. I was told to expect cramping and bleeding within a few hours and advised to take ibuprofen for the pain. Soon after, I began experiencing excruciating pain in my lower abdomen and back with the pain radiating down to my legs. It was so intense that it forced me to stop everything. Suddenly, I felt a large mass pass from my body. I rushed to the restroom and when I sat down, I discovered a large bloody fleshy mass. Overwhelmed, I started screaming and crying. My significant other ran into the bathroom and through tears, I shakenly handed him my blood-stained undergarments, begging him to take them away because I couldn't bear it. Over the next two years, in 2021 and 2022, we endured two additional miscarriages, both caused by chromosomal abnormalities. Due to the trauma I experienced during the first miscarriage, my doctor performed DNC procedures for the subsequent losses. After experiencing three miscarriages, we decided to change healthcare providers, leaving a large hospital system for a doctor I trusted. Upon meeting with him, he immediately began working with us on treatments to conceive. We went through one round of IUI, and about a month before our second round was scheduled, we spontaneously became pregnant. This was exciting news, given our previous experiences. We were confident that this was our rainbow baby. When I called the doctor's office to share the news, they asked me to come in immediately to confirm the pregnancy. We found out we were four weeks and four days pregnant. The doctor advised me that because of my age, it was a high-risk pregnancy and suggested I take it easy. 
He wanted to monitor me weekly to ensure everything was progressing well. As I left the office, the concerns about the abortion ban filled my mind because I knew that as an older mother, I was at a higher risk of miscarriage or complications, and I began to worry. When I shared my fears with my fiance, he reassured me saying, we're going to stay positive. We're going to have this baby. His words gave me hope, and I started to embrace the pregnancy, excited for the journey ahead. That weekend, I noticed light brown spotting and immediately panicked. I texted my doctor, and he told me to take progesterone suppositories, to be on bed rest, and to come in first thing Monday morning. At that appointment, the fetus showed growth. The doctor reassured me that everything was fine and wanted me to remain on bed rest with weekly checkups to monitor my progress. However, at my six-week checkup, we learned that the fetus had stopped growing and there was no detectable heartbeat. I broke down, knowing that we were likely experiencing another miscarriage. The doctor tried to comfort me, explaining that sometimes the heartbeat wasn't detectable until the seventh week. He reminded me that my blood levels were still improving and that stress could negatively affect the pregnancy. He urged me to have faith and to not lose hope. With those words, I left the office, heartbroken, but clinging to a thread of faith. The following week, there was still no growth or heartbeat. I asked about a DNC, but the doctor said it required a second confirmation and that the hospital had better equipment to confirm a miscarriage. After the nurse at the hospital performed the ultrasound, she informed me that there was no heartbeat and my doctor would follow up with me with the results. At my follow-up appointment, which would have me at eight weeks, the doctor confirmed the miscarriage. I asked again about the DNC and he spoke around the topic then stated these laws. I don't want to lose my license or be arrested and recommended that my body handle the process naturally. It was healthier, he said. He mentioned using the pills would cause too much bleeding and sent me home, advising me to call when it started. Confused on the way home, I searched online and I found that the abortion laws were unclear and left doctors unsure of how to properly treat miscarriages. I sought advice, calling the emergency room and Planned Parenthood, only to be told that I had to follow my doctor's advice. Planned Parenthood told me that they could not help me with the miscarriage due to our new state law and the time frame I was in for my pregnancy and that I could try a clinic in another state, but it was a possibility I would get turned away due to not being a resident. I called a clinic in North Carolina and was told they only treat patients who live in the state. I even joined miscarriage support groups to try to find other resources, but that was not successful. With no other option, I felt I had no choice but to let the miscarriage happen naturally. A week later, I started to experience severe cramping and pains. A few days after that, I began to bleed. I was experiencing severe pain as the cramps were strong enough to stop me from doing anything. The doctor had me lay down on the table and he performed a pelvic exam which caused further pain in my vaginal area. I voiced how painful it was. He then said he knew why I was in so much pain that there were clots and tissue in my cervix. I'll get it out and you will feel better. He then turned to the cabinet behind him, pulled out what looked like a large pair of metal scissors and inserted them into my vaginal area, which caused me to scream out and cry uncontrollably. This procedure, where the doctor removed tissue without any pain medication, was by far worse than what I experienced when I went through a DNC. I cried out, please, I don't want to do this anymore. Please stop only to be met with, I can't work like this. At that point, the doctor stopped the procedure and the nurse gave me two ibuprofen 800s. My body was shaking from having gone through so much pain. About 30 minutes later, the doctor came back into the room. He told me that it was a little bit more to remove. I was unaware I had to go through more of this and told him I didn't want to continue. It hurt too bad. He told me he had to do it. We don't want to have an infection and proceeded to back to remove what was left in my cervix. When he finished, he said, we got it all out. You should feel better soon. He apologized for having to perform the procedure and he told me he was trying to help. 
I was then sent home and to come back on Monday for a follow-up to ensure it was all completely gone. I left the office devastated and physically sore and called my fiance crying. That evening, his cousin, a midwife, visited and was horrified by what I had gone through. She advised using blue and black cohosh root, herbs that aid in childbirth to help expel the remaining tissue. Following her advice, I rescheduled my appointment, and by the time I returned, the doctor found no remaining tissue. I didn't have to go through this. These laws created so much fear and confusion that I couldn't get the care I needed that would have spared me so much pain and suffering. As a result of what I went through, we have given up on hopes of ever being pregnant again. Thank you, Ms. Ziad. Dr. Swiak. Thank you, Senator Ossoff and the members of the subcommittee for allowing me to speak today alongside two very courageous women. I'm a board certified fellowship trained obstetrician gynecologist and family planning specialist. I'm a member of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the Society of Family Planning. I have provided comprehensive OBGYN and reproductive health care in Georgia for 23 years. I am director of a fellowship and a resident training program in family planning, which includes abortion and contraceptive care. I have a master in public health degree in epidemiology. I have conducted research on the impact of Georgia's restrictive abortion ban on individuals as well as on the state. My views expressed in my testimony today are my own and do not necessarily represent the views of my employer, Emory University. I have observed firsthand how patients have been adversely impacted by this ban. Although the volume of patients served has decreased since the ban came into effect, abortion is not rare. That is because doctors and clinics in our state recognize the need to continue to provide care within the confines of the legislation. Following safe, evidence-based practices, we work to see patients as early as possible in their pregnancy. As with any other medical decision, we provide patient-centered counseling to each person who, prevents, who presents for abortion care, providing factual information, benefits, and risks for each option to help them make their own decision based on their personal values and needs. We began to hear a common theme People tell us that time is limited by the ban. They feel under the gun to make a decision whether to abort their pregnancy. We want to continue to allow people the time they need after finding out they are pregnant to think and decide what to do about their pregnancy like they would with any other medical decision that's important for their lives. But the decision is always theirs to make. I continue to see pregnant women who have a high-risk medical condition develop a pregnancy-related complication or discover their fetus has a congenital defect. Make no mistake, this restrictive ban has increased maternal mortality and poor health outcomes. In Georgia and other restrictive states, we have learned of case after case of pregnant women being turned away or experiencing delays in their care. Within this ban, legislators with no medical expertise have created limited definitions that simply are not used in the practice of medicine. Complex medical situations cannot be distilled into a law with strict limitations, especially when they don't make medical sense. I have talked to many physicians throughout the state who are confused by the language in the law. In large part, this is due to new rules that don't fit the reality of what people experience in pregnancy and the harsh criminal penalties physicians face if a prosecutor, judge, or jury doesn't agree with their medical judgment. When is something an emergency? When is pregnancy futile? When do the exceptions apply? Physicians, hospitals, and clinics work to understand the ban's language to determine whether they can provide the standard of care within the confines of the law. Medical care is put on hold as we search for legal clarity. As a result, patients may be de denied timely effective care. In Atlanta, 
Physicians, myself included, have seen patients in the ICU with sepsis, with renal failure, needing tube feeds, with hemorrhage, needing blood transfusions or a hysterectomy, who would not have been in those positions if we had been able to offer them care to avoid further harm. It is the standard of care to offer a termination of pregnancy to patients experiencing a complication early in pregnancy because it is the safer option for them. These outcomes would not happen if their providers were able to practice medicine in an ethical and evidence-based manner. As physicians, we are trained to identify when a patient is at high risk so we can provide care to prevent them harm. If we need to wait until harm is already occurring, we're often too late to prevent the consequences. Deciding when to intervene in an emergency involves many aspects that often have nothing to do with the presence of fetal cardiac activity, and yet the law sets an arbitrary limit to the care we can provide. For example, sometimes I see a pregnant woman in the midst of a miscarriage, but with a fetus that still has cardiac activity. Even when cardiac activity is present, if this is happening very early in pregnancy, sadly, she will not be able to deliver a baby that will survive. The standard of care is to offer expectant management when possible, but also termination of pregnancy when needed. In this case, terminating a pregnancy that was already in the process of ending is medically considered miscarriage management. However, if fetal cardiac activity is present, Georgia's ban defines this care as abortion and limits the care I can provide. The ban does not adequately address how to care for a patient with an early pregnancy complication in which fetal cardiac activity is still present, but an emergency has not yet occurred. And so delays in care occur as hospitals, physicians, and clinics are unsure how to proceed. In addition, the term medical futility is not a medical definition, but a legal one. So what does futility mean? What does it mean for a fetus to be incapable of sustaining life? That they will die at birth? In two days? At one year of life? That there's zero chance of survival? What if there's 10% chance? Sometimes I see a pregnant woman after her ultrasound identifies a life-limiting birth defect in her fetus. Birth defects can have a range of possible anatomic or functional abnormalities that may or may not all be apparent by ultrasound. Women in this situation have seven times the risk of pregnancy complications, as well as the high chance their baby may not survive. We counsel them on the details of their baby's condition, estimating the impact on the baby's life and health so that they have the information they need to decide whether or not to continue the pregnancy. In these situations, medical risk is rarely discussed in black and white or with certainty, and yet women ultimately make the decision that is best for them and their families according to their values and beliefs. The ban does not adequately address how to care for a patient like this with a life-limiting birth defect. The law puts these patients all in the same category, regardless of their individual circumstances. And the exception for rape or incest also sets arbitrary limits that do not address the needs of sexual assault survivors. Only 20% of survivors file a police report for sexual assault. A police report does not change the medical care they need. It's not a medically necessary step. A physician may ask a patient if they filed a police report to provide advice. Are they still in danger? Do they need any assistance with contacting the police? But not because it improves their health care. Forcing a physician to ask a patient to involve law enforcement as a condition of their receiving medical care undermines patient trust, ultimately harming their health. And sexual assault survivors often delay care because of the trauma of their experience. For that and other reasons, they are more likely to present late for care. And yet the, the ban only allows for abortion before the quote-unquote post-fertilization age of 20 weeks. This is the only exception uh, that has a gestational age limit associated with it. 
Post-fertilization pregnancy dating is stated in the ban is another legal term as pregnancies are dated after the last menstrual period rather than the date of fertilization. This has created additional confusion for physicians, hospitals, and patients in their understanding of the law. Once again, the ban does not adequately address how to care for a patient like this after an assault when we need to consider the trauma they have experienced while providing the compassionate health care they need. In sum, because of Georgia's abortion ban, hospitals, clinics, and physicians have no choice but to turn away patients in need of essential health care. Every day that it's in effect, Georgians suffer an assault to their autonomy and needless risk to their health and lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swiak. Thank you to all three of our witnesses for your opening statements and for sharing Ms. Kulik and Ms. Ziad such deeply personal stories. It takes tremendous courage to do so. And you're speaking for countless others who have experienced deeply painful and damaging outcomes as a result of Georgia's abortion ban. So the subcommittee and I are grateful to you for your testimony today. Ms. Kulik, I'm so sorry for the loss you experienced and that you were unable to get the care that you needed in our state. I want to begin by reviewing what happened when you first learned that you had low amniotic fluid. As you mentioned, you're a research scientist. What did you find when you looked in to the effects of low amniotic fluid in your personal research? Um, I found that oligohydramnios or low amniotic fluid can cause a lot of different types of complications um, for the pregnancy. Some of the more visible ones are caused by without the cushion of the amniotic fluid, the baby just doesn't really have room to grow and their limbs kind of contract toward their bodies, um, which can then cause also bone fractures. Um, and then additionally, they're also at a higher risk of suffering an umbilical cord accidents where the umbilical cord would get crushed as the baby grows. Um, and then additionally, I think probably the more serious complication involves their lung development. Um, so a baby's lung development, a critical time for that kind of starts around week 16, where the baby basically essentially practices breathing using the fluid, the amniotic fluid. And that is what stimulates the growth of their lungs. And so without that amniotic fluid, then the lungs do not have a chance to develop to become functional. And then additionally, if the oligohydramnios is caused by a preterm premature rupture of membranes or, the, or your water breaking early, that can leave um, the mother more likely to develop an internal infection. And so in my case, it was kind of a combination of all three of those things that um, caused my pregnancy to essentially be non-viable. Um, we believe based on a couple of different symptoms that I had that my water broke likely um, between week 12 and 13. So I was at risk of developing an infection and my baby did not have that amniotic fluid to start practicing breathing and for their lungs to develop um, at all. Weeks later, when a scan confirmed that your baby was starting to show visibly abnormal development, you had to raise the possibility of a termination with your doctor yourself, correct? Yes, that is correct. And even after you asked your doctor whether you needed to consider termination, your doctor only discussed it with you off the record. She told you that your conversation would not be reflected in your visit notes and you could not ask follow-up questions. Do I have that right? Yes, that is correct. She told me that she would know if I decided to terminate if I didn't show up to my appointment the following week. And in that, quote, off the record conversation, your doctor confirmed that if you continued your pregnancy, either your baby was going to die in utero or shortly after birth, or you were likely to develop an infection. But still, you were unable to terminate the pregnancy in Georgia. Is that correct? 
Yes, that is correct. She said I had, would have to travel out of Georgia. Okay. What was it like for you as a patient to have to yourself conduct the research, raise your own diagnosis and treatment options with your doctors who seemed unwilling to discuss them candidly with you under the law? <clears throat> when I was first diagnosed at week 17, I was in the hospital um, receiving having an overnight observation. And when I had this diagnosis of oligohydramnios, which was something that I had never heard of, um, based on my training and what I do, the most logical thing for me was to then go to PubMed, which is a health literature database, and look up all the related articles and data that I could find um, on oligohydramnios. And that would help me figure out what was the best way or was the best treatment and options for my situation. And as I was reading through the articles, the first things that I first thing that I noticed really was that there were not many um, studies that included uh, cases that were similar to mine. And I started realizing that most of the time when your water breaks um, around week 12 or 13 or early on, that the pregnancy usually ends in a spontaneous abortion um, or a miscarriage. But that didn't happen for me. My water had broken four weeks earlier and my baby was still had a heartbeat and was still growing slowly. So as I kept reading and reading different articles and doing the research, I realized that the most that that the most recommended treatment in my case was to terminate the pregnancy. And it was extremely um, frustrating and upsetting to have to read that for myself and not have a physician with training with the knowledge be the one to tell me that. And it took me, I think, a couple of weeks to truly accept that that was going to be the outcome of our pregnancy. Um, and like you said, it wasn't until the 20 week appointments when we saw the visible effects that I was able to get the courage um, to bring that up to my physician and to ask if that's what, what we should consider doing. Um, and frankly, if I hadn't, if I hadn't done that research and I kept continued or continued to follow her advice, their advice, I would have just continued to monitor, rest, and drink water and continue to have some false hope that maybe my pregnancy would turn around, even though the full reality of the situation was it was going to be a non-viable pregnancy. And I think um, the Georgia's abortion ban has a lot of different detri detrimental effects, but one of the biggest things that I found was the breakdown of that trust and that relationship between a patient and their physician. A patient should be able to, to trust that their physician is give, being transparent in their prognosis, as well as giving them all of the treatment options available. And with Georgia's ban in place, it makes it almost impossible for that to happen. You touched on this in your testimony, but what was it like as you were processing this news about the viability of your pregnancy to then have to organize to leave the state to get the care that you needed? It was a logistical nightmare to try and organize, to spend hours and hours organizing all of the appointments that are necessary, and then also organizing just the actual travel itself. Um, we chose to go to DC for my termination because it was the closest option. Um, where I could also receive in-network care for my insurance. And for my procedure, it was a, it consists of a multiple appointments over a three-day period, um, some prep appointments on the day before prior to the surgery. And 
So we, when we traveled to DC, we were staying in a hotel with surrounded by tourists who are excited to go sightseeing and they're excited to go to the cherry blossom festival, which started on the day of my surgery while we were there trying to process the loss of our child, the loss of this life that we were preparing for. And that was just a surreal experience. And then the night before my surgery, I spent the night before my surgery laying on a cold hotel bathroom floor, listening to the elevator doors open and close um, with people coming back from a fun night out while I was just trying to find any relief from the worst nausea and physical pain that I had ever been in. And then the morning of my surgery, I ended up having to lay down on the dirty concrete outside, waiting for our Uber driver to find us and get to our, the correct side of the street to pick us up while commuters were just walking by on their way to work because I was in too much pain to stand or sit. And then once we got in the Uber to go to the hospital, I had to sit there in this over air freshened car, trying not to throw up. And also just hoping that the pad that I had put on would hold and I wouldn't bleed through onto the seat of some stranger's car. And then after the surgery, the day after the surgery, I had to shuffle around a crowded airport wearing again, period underwear, a pad and the largest sweatpants that I own, just hoping that that would be enough to get me home, to get me back to Atlanta without having to get up from the middle seat of a crowded airplane and make it to the bathroom to try and change that. And the most frustrating thing is none of that stuff even needed to happen. When you're sick or you're not feeling well, I think people just want, you just want to be at home. You want to be at home in your own bed to be able to lay on your own bathroom floor. But the laws in Georgia took that like one small comfort that I could have had in a terrible experience away. And it made uh, what was clearly already a traumatic experience just that much worse. And it's really something that I think no one should have to go through. This ordeal of discomfort and displacement and travel while ill amidst losing a pregnancy after having been informed only when you prodded and pried your healthcare provider that the baby was likely to die in utero or shortly after birth and that you were at risk of a life-threatening infection and that these medical conversations could only happen, quote, off the record and that you had to leave the state to get the care that you needed. What is your message for those who made this law? Um, I would say, you know, I... In, in some ways, I consider myself lucky that I had the resources and the ability to travel, that my husband and I work flexible enough jobs that we were able to take that time off, that we only had to coordinate care for our dog and not another child. And then especially that I had insurance that still covered these procedures, even though they were out of state. And I think my message is not every woman has that or has the ability to do that. And that causes them to be more at risk for other adverse health outcomes and complications. And while I'm thankful to be here to tell my, to be able to tell my story, the truth is I wish I was not here. And I wish this hearing didn't have to happen. 
if I had had a healthy, normal pregnancy, I would be at home right now with a seven-week-old baby, uh, probably worrying about my maternity leave ending. But that didn't happen. And not a lot of women don't have the healthy, normal pregnancy that they're expecting and hoping to have. And these laws just make everything worse for them and make it impossible for them to get the care that they need. And I would hope that with, with my testimony and the testimony of these other women here today, that the policymakers might be able to see the detrimental effects that these laws have on women who call Georgia home. Thank you, Ms. Kulik. Dr. Swiak, you testified that Georgia's abortion ban has increased maternal mortality and poor health outcomes. What evidence are you seeing right now that this ban is driving poor health outcomes and higher risks of harm to Georgia women in our state? Well, when we look at the experience uh, of women in Georgia and in similar states with restrictive bans, we are seeing higher rates of um, maternal mortality and morbidity, meaning the poor health outcomes. Um, in Georgia, preliminary data shows an increase of emergency room visits among women early in pregnancy. And if you're seeing an increase in emergency room visits, it usually has some reflection on the fact that people can't receive the care that they need uh, in order to prevent that emergency or prevent that, that visit seeking care. Um, we have seen firsthand among patients that present to us for care that, um, that they have either been turned away from other um, uh, locations or or experienced a delay in care. And as people are confused about what to do with this law, as doctors and hospitals are confused about how to interpret this law, they may feel that they need to wait until an emergency happens, wait until the adverse health outcome happens before they can act. And so instead of using our typical medical expertise that tells us when there's a high risk of something happening and intervening to prevent it, many of us feel like we need to wait until we see evidence of, infect of infection happening or evidence of um, uh, significant hemorrhage happening. And, uh, and therefore, it's, it's increasing the, the chance that that people are exactly experiencing these complications rather than having them prevented. Talk a little bit more, please, about pregnant patients who are turned away from care and for whom or for whom care is significantly delayed. What kinds of cases and how does that happen under this state's abortion ban? Well, as I mentioned before, the law does not adequately address how to care for patients that we see are at higher risk for a complication or an emergency, but where it has not yet occurred. Uh, the question that physicians across the state are often asking is how close to an emergency do you need to be to assure you can act in that time? Uh, the uh, law itself has a chilling effect because uh, instead of being able to rely on uh, guidelines of medical ethics, national guidelines, standard of care, evidence-based practices. We now have a law that threatens us with criminal prosecution if, uh, if a, a prosecutor uh, doesn't agree with our medical judgment in a circumstance. And what occurs is then physicians are unsure how to act um, while they're waiting for clarity uh, then they may feel that they can't take care of a patient in a particular situation or they may uh, wait until they act in that situation. 
The other thing to think about is that it's not just the physician acting on their own. We provide this care within a hospital or within a clinic, with nurses, with anesthesiologists, and everyone has to decide that, that they feel comfortable with the, uh, with the interpretation of the law and that we can proceed in a certain situation. Dr. Swiak, we've heard in, in two statements today about uh, physicians who, under the state's abortion ban, have expressed that medical advice needs to be off the record or uh, expressed their fear of prosecution or loss of their license. Does the threat of prosecution faced by doctors under Georgia's abortion ban make doctors less able to provide the standard of care in cases where pregnant patients have high risk or non-viable pregnancies? Yes, we know the standard of care is based on medical evidence. Uh, it's based on uh, uh, well-established practices in which we can provide uh, the safest options for patients. And yet, uh, without any, um, any medical sense, um, this, this ban uh, provides definitions and limitations uh, that have nothing to do with the standard of care. And so it's very confusing. Um, and that's what leads um, uh, physicians and, and hospitals to, to be unsure how to, how to proceed. Um, if uh, you are in a private practice um, by yourself or a small practice, if you're in a rural area, if you're in a small hospital, you may not have the resources and the expertise uh, to um, to uh, allow you the additional uh, legal expertise to be able to interpret the law. And so um, uh, so throughout the state, um, physicians are very uh, unsure of how to proceed in those situations unless it's very clear that it's an emergency or very clear that it's a that it's a futile pregnancy. And even then, who knows what very clear means? And delays in care can be life-threatening, correct? There was a report this morning I saw in ProPublica, uh, apparently uh, a patient for whom a delay in care led to a preventable uh, fatal outcome. Delays in care can cause life-threatening complications, emergencies, uh, or increase the risk of significant injury, correct? Yes. Um, miscarriage is very common in pregnancy. It happens uh, in about 20% of pregnancies, and sometimes those do occur and are completed without any complications. But there are times when um, hemorrhage develops uh, before the miscarriage can be completed, uh, where uh, before the miscarriage can be completed while the cervix is dilated or the amniotic fluid has already broken, um, infection um, uh, enters into the uterus. Um, this can lead to um, sepsis, which is, which is an overwhelming um, infection of the bodily, bodily organs. Um, hemorrhage can lead to a significant loss of blood that can also lead to hemorrhagic shock. Um, even if uh, patients do survive these complications, uh, they uh, may lose their chance to, to have another healthy pregnancy if they um, develop scarring in their uterus from an infection or lose their uterus from hemorrhage. Thank you, Dr. Swiak. Uh, Ms. Ziad, thank you again for your courage sharing your experience today, for sharing what you had to endure while experiencing your miscarriage. When, when you first found out that your pregnancy was not viable, and you'd been trying, as you laid out for us multiple times, what was your initial reaction? I was extremely heartbroken because I had literally accepted that this pregnancy was going to go to full term and that the challenges that we had faced prior to were over and this was our rainbow baby. Ms. Ziad, you testified that when you learned you were miscarrying, 
you requested a surgical abortion or a DNC. Why did you make that request of your doctor? I did that for my own personal health, um, being that the first miscarriage I experienced was during COVID. I experienced that at home alone, and it was traumatizing for me mentally, physically, and emotionally. I didn't have the courage to go through it again, and that's why I asked for the DNC. And you had had safe and successful DNCs to manage other miscarriages, correct? Yes, in 2021 and 2022. Dr. Zwiak, why is it in the interests of a patient's health to have an active management strategy for a miscarriage? For example, in a case uh, that may resemble Ms. Ziad's, so as I mentioned before, um, sometimes miscarriages can be completed on their own and sometimes uh, patients do choose that and they, and they can choose that. But sometimes uh, it doesn't happen uh, immediately. Sometimes it takes days or weeks uh, to complete. Um, and in those cases, um, complications can develop, um, as I mentioned, like hemorrhage um, or infection. Um, in addition, uh, the, the surgery uh, that is done for active management of um, a miscarriage is the same as the surgery that's done for abortion care. And so um, it can be confusing um, for, uh, for people that may misinterpret why uh, a physician may want to do a DNC. They may misunderstand and... and um, and tell them that they can't uh, provide that care because it's it's not allowed under the law. Especially if you have a situation, as I mentioned before, if you have a miscarriage uh, where um, that loss is happening naturally, um, but the fetus still has cardiac activity, providing a DNC, providing medication management in those situations, uh, which is the, those are the safer options for, for women. Um, uh, because the cardiac activity is still present, those are considered um, under the law to be abortion care. And so um, it, it sets up an arbitrary uh, limit to, to the type of care we can provide, even in these situations where it's necessary to, to provide the safest care. Go ahead, Ms. Yet. Um, I also would like to add part of the reason I wanted the DNC is during COVID, um, I was sent home with those pills, vaginally and orally, and I was told that I should experience some cramping and bleeding. However, when I did get home, I did, in fact, experience severe cramping, um, severe lower back pain, and then the bleeding began. And then shortly after, I felt what felt like a, a large mass being passed. And so I remember running to the restroom and upon sitting down on the toilet, there was a large ball of bloody fleshy mass in my underwear. Um, and I knew what it was. That was my deceased fetus passing my body. And I screamed for my fiance who came upstairs and I handed him my bloody undergarments and I told him just discard it. I continued to bleed and have those contractions and cramps for the rest of the week. The following week I went in for a follow-up and upon looking at the ultrasound, the doctor saw that there was still some remaining tissue. I was given more medication and sent home. Overall, it took about two and a half weeks for my body to expel the unborn fetus. And that was a pain I didn't want to experience again. And Ms. Ziad, when, because you didn't want to experience that again, you requested a DNC from your doctor for the later miscarriage, the doctor declined to perform one for you. Is that correct? Yes, he just said, you know, these laws, um, 
I don't want to be arrested or lose my practice. And so I didn't understand what he meant by that. And so on the way home, I, I Googled and I found all these articles that were talking about how the abortion ban was unclear for doctors and it left them with their hands tied because they didn't know how to properly care for women experiencing miscarriages. So, Mizzy, just to be clear, you had previously miscarried, had a traumatic experience. You and your fiancé were trying again to conceive a child. You'd become pregnant. You were hopeful. You learned that once again you were miscarrying. You asked your doctor to manage the miscarriage with the DNC. The doctor said that the doctor could not because the laws put him at risk of criminal prosecution or of loss of his license, correct? Yes. And how did it feel to you when your doctor refused to perform the procedure you thought you needed to, mis to manage your miscarriage, citing Georgia's abortion ban as a reason for being unable to provide that care? First of all, I was extremely hurt, but I was even more so angry. Not necessarily at my doctor because I knew that this wasn't his fault. I was angry at the lawmakers who wrote and approved this law because they didn't keep in mind women like me who were at higher risk of miscarriage. They took away completely the trust between a woman and her doctor. Like that's, that's personal and it's sacred. And after having been denied the DNC procedure that you sought to manage this miscarriage, you then, as you described to the subcommittee earlier, had to undergo a very painful procedure to remove tissue that had been retained. Is that correct? That is. That was like the worst experience I've ever had in my life. It was extremely dehumanizing. I felt like an animal on that table. I felt like my mental and physical well-being, it didn't matter. I felt like my voice wasn't being heard and I did not feel protected. It's not my doctor's fault. He was only doing the best that he could given the circumstances. But unfortunately, I had to go through a, a procedure that wasn't even necessary had they given me the DNC. Dr. Swiak, we've heard testimony today from two Georgia women who were forced either to continue with a non-viable pregnancy in the midst of miscarriage or to leave the state to access the care they needed having been informed that the baby would either die in utero or shortly after birth and that there was a significant risk of infection. Are these isolated cases based on your experience since Georgia enacted this law? Unfortunately, they're not isolated cases. As I mentioned before, miscarriage is a common occurrence. Uh, pregnancy complications uh, are uh, unfortunately more common than we recognize. People with high-risk medical conditions uh, that, that have a complicated pregnancy need care. Their doctors need to be able to provide them the ethical safe, evidence-based care that they've been trained to do, that they're able to do, to provide them the care that they need, whether that be allowing them to, to see if they can manage a miscarriage expectantly or take medication or have pain medication and anesthesia in order to go through a surgery that could be traumatizing or painful. 
They need to be able to be there. The patients need to be able to be there with their with their physicians to be comforted by them, to be at, near their home, to be uh, at a place where they don't have to travel for a great distance, to wonder about how they're going to uh, talk to their insurance company about covering a procedure, their medical care, even if they have to go out of state. Um, they shouldn't have to feel this betrayal um, that uh, that they do when they're forced to to seek care out of state rather than rather than in their own home. Dr. Swiak, we've heard from Ms. Ziad, who was unable to get health care during a miscarriage and forced to continue a non-viable pregnancy. We've heard testimony from Ms. Kulik, who was told that she was at risk of infection, that the baby was likely to die in utero or shortly after birth and was forced to leave the state. They have testified powerfully to the emotional impact on them of these experiences. What's the impact on healthcare providers of being unable to provide the standard of care to pregnant patients in these situations under threat of criminal prosecution? When you are a healthcare provider that has taken an oath to do no harm to your patient, and when you are uh, taught and given the ability to provide uh, ethical, safe healthcare to your patients to help them, to help them in their lives, to to help them be healthy for the next normal pregnancy they may have, but you're not able to provide it because you're hamstrung by a law that doesn't make medical sense, that doesn't fit ethical standard of practice, it carries great moral injury and moral distress. And that's not just to physicians. That's to uh, people that work in hospitals and clinics and nurses and the anesthesiologists that assist in these procedures. Um, it carries throughout all of the providers in the healthcare system that are um, trained and committed to helping women receive the safest care that they can get. Before we hear whatever final remarks Ms. Kulik and Ms. Ziad would like to make, I want to touch on one part of your opening statement that, that struck me about the exceptions, the so-called exceptions built into this law for survivors of rape and sexual assault. Can you recap why would this requirement of a police report that is inadequate to ensure that survivors of sexual assault can receive the health care they need? Yes, so um, there are only a minority of sexual assault survivors that file a police report. Um, maybe they know their assailant and don't want to put themselves in further danger. Um, maybe they feel uh, afraid to approach law enforcement. Maybe they don't feel that law enforcement will be able to help them in their situation. Um, uh, in any case, when they come to me for health care, I should be able to provide them the health care that they need without requiring that they involve law enforcement because whether or not they decide to file a police report doesn't change the fact that they need health care and they need, it, they need me to provide it as soon as possible for them. And so if I am acting as um, an agent of law enforcement in the sense of saying, well, I can't provide you health care unless you, unless you do this, um, then it's undermining our doctor-patient relationship and they're not receiving the health care they need. In addition, um, as I mentioned, uh, sexual assault providers are less likely to present in a timely fashion for care. They're more likely to delay. They've been traumatized by the event. Uh, they may be out of touch with their bodies as a result. They may not want to recognize that they could be pregnant by their assailant. And so uh, they are less likely to present in a timely fashion for health care. And so to have uh, a, a gestational age limit, a time limit specifically on that exception 
for the people who actually even more so need our compassionate and patient healthcare in the face of their trauma is, is, um, is it just adds another unnecessary and um, incomprehensible barrier to their healthcare. Thank you, Dr. Swiak, for sharing your expertise today. And uh, once again, Ms. Kulik and Ziad, thank you for your courage sharing this personal testimony with the Senate and the public. would like to offer you the opportunity to uh, add anything you wish to add, perhaps share with the public why you chose to come and testify today. Uh, Ms. Ziad, please. I came here today because it was at one point when I finally accepted that I had to go through this process at home. I called my sister and I remember yelling to her, why did this have to happen to me? It's got to be, it's got to take me somewhere else. It's got to be for a bigger reason. This law, in my opinion, is stupid. It wasn't fully thought out. They did not consider the fact that medically, women that get in their mid-30s are considered geriatric and are automatically high-risk pregnancies. And that's the result of the majority of our eggs aren't as healthy anymore, which causes a lot of chromosomal abnormalities, which results in spontaneous miscarriages. This law does not consider us. And a lot of women my age, we're waiting till we get older to have families. So it's pretty much saying with this law, do it while you're young, inexperienced, and not that capable of taking care of your child in the full capacity, or else you're going to risk not being able to have your dream at all. I have a 24-year-old daughter who was a part of the LGBTQ community. So eventually when she decides to have a child, the route that she's trying to go, this ban is gonna permit her from doing it. I have to look out for her on top of any other female coming behind me because this is our future generation. I could have gotten an infection in my opinion, I felt like I did. We gotta stop this. Like, we have to carry on our day-to-day -day lives while our body is undergoing a miscarriage. So not only are we dealing with the emotional and psychological effects of us losing our child, we're dealing with the fact that our own doctors, because of our government, is limited in taking care of us properly. Our lives are on hand at any point during this process. Somebody has to speak up for us. Thank you, Ms. Ziad. Ms. Kulik, you have the last word. A few months after I went to DC for my abortion, I did find out that I was pregnant again. And unfortunately, that pregnancy ended in an early miscarriage. But in that short time that I was pregnant, I can tell you that pregnancy after loss is all anxiety and fear and no real joy or happiness. And the experience that I went through with my first pregnancy and living in Georgia, knowing that if something were to happen again, if I were pregnant again, or when I was pregnant again, because I was at higher risk of having these complications, that I would again have to travel and go through the same thing because of the laws in the state that I live in. And I just want the policymakers to know that women in Georgia need access to health care, health care that includes abortions, because not all pregnancies go the way that we had planned. And they shouldn't have to leave their home in order to receive the medically necessary care that they are being prescribed by their doctor. Thank you, Ms. Kulik. It is critically important that the public hear directly from healthcare providers and from women.
who have been denied basic health care in the state of Georgia as a result of our state's abortion ban. And I am grateful to each of you for sharing your experiences with us today and your expertise. As we heard from Dr. Swiak, these brave women who testified here today are not alone. This abortion ban is causing needless health complications for women across the state. And as we've heard today, forcing women with high risk or non-viable pregnancies either to continue those pregnancies or to leave the state for health care. I'll note for my colleagues that questions for the record may be submitted by senators by 5 p.m. on Monday, September 23rd. And with gratitude again for our witnesses and for the team who helped to produce, put together this hearing, as well as the law enforcement personnel who have kept us safe during this event and the Fulton County government for their hospitality, the hearing is adjourned.